taking inspiration from another's work is something every creative person does in order to circumvent the slow process of having to figure out things entirely for themselves. If every musician had to figure out tempo and harmonies alone, then all music would be chaotic noise until someone notices a pair of sounds connecting. This collaboration of ideas, voluntary or not, allows people to develop their skills much faster and produce higher quality pieces much sooner. I believe my influences are quite visible, which has allowed my videos to improve at a much faster rate than they would have without those that came before me. To be influenced by something, and even to pay homage to it, are totally acceptable within creative spaces, but things start to get dubious as the later pieces look too similar to the inspiration. As the 2010s approached, video game developers were looking at Resident Evil 4's revolutionary reinterpretation of the third person shooter and allowing it to inform their work throughout the next few years. Sometimes subtle nods to the game, and sometimes blatant plagiarism. While there were 2D games that featured a third person perspective and encouraged the player to shoot things, it was the shift into 3D that really solidified the third person shooter as an independent genre. Tomb Raider, Mega Man Legends, and MDK would broaden the player's perspective of the environments they were exploring, as well as allow the player to see exactly how enemy attacks would collide with their character. Controls for aiming attacks would always be cumbersome, but that was the price the player paid for awareness of their size in the 3D space. When Capcom released Resident Evil 4 in 2005, the way players and developers perceived the function of a third-person shooter shifted over to the left. Leon's placement in the lower left of the screen prevented him from blocking the player's view, as well as allowing the much-refined aiming mechanics of first-person shooters to be translated over. With this innovation, third-person shooters wouldn't have to be the awkward experiences they had been previously. This inspired a sudden surge of titles within the genre, as many developers tried to capture the audience's attention with their own spin on the Resident Evil 4 mechanical base. Gears of War would go for scale and spectacle. Dead Space would lean even farther into the horror themes that Resident Evil 4 had minimized. And Uncharted, Drake's Fortune, put a lot of stock into its writing and Hollywood blockbuster persona. In 2006, Canadian developer Digital Extremes saw their development partners on the Unreal series finding great success with their third-person shooter project, and Digital Extremes decided they wanted a piece of the action. So despite being a few years removed from the industry explosion that was Resident Evil 4, Dark Sector's similarities are still very clear. Hayden lives in the lower left corner, the shooting mechanics are passable, ammo is scattered throughout the levels, and there's even a shop run by a man with a totally European accent. Look who it is! My favorite half-monster customer! The shooting and ammo distribution are sort of odd within the Dark Sector context. They're remnants from the Resident Evil's survival horror entries, and while they serve an understandable function within a survival horror setting, in the more action-orientated environment of Dark Sector, these limitations don't seem necessary. Dark Sector does contain horror elements, and for the most part, they're appropriately contextualized within the world, but a survival horror, this is not. Hayden's regenerating health and access to a ranged weapon at all times means that the two most nerve-wracking gameplay mechanics within a survival horror game aren't present within Dark Sector. Moreover, while there are many locations within the game that have been geniusly directed to deliver a fantastic horror atmosphere, there are narrative reasons that a lot of the horror themes throughout the game are incoherent. Oh yeah! What the heck was up with that black goo? I hate black goo. Normally, a game uses black goo and it makes sense. Like Alice, The Madness Returns, Prince of Persia, Spider-Man. It's a bit of a trope, but I've never seen a game put black goo all over the walls and block the hallways, and then later in the game act like it never happened. Is it zombie poop? Zombie poop? Why is it there? Tell me. And while you're at it, tell me what was up with those zombie guys coming up from the grave in the graveyard level. They weren't real zombies. 
they were infected. Did they fall over and someone was like, screw it, bury them alive? Or did they see old Hayden coming and decide to ambush him in the most stereotypical way possible, like, surprise, I was in the grave all along. I talk about them being infected like I even know what the infection leads to. Hayden got infected and it looked bad for like five seconds and then he turned into a damn Captain America Winter Soldier hybrid. What the hell happened to these other guys? They look horrible. Then there are the guns you can't use if you are infected. But the infected look like they aren't even smart enough to use a bat as a weapon. What a waste of time. How much money does Lazria have that they can mod all their guns? Well, I guess if the infected are smart enough to bury themselves for a graveyard ambush, they can certainly link up, mobilize, and use those guns. The military only has AI turrets and big daddy mech suits and tons of guns and helicopters and explosives and a fully evacuated city to battle on. How can they possibly compete? They need an edge. I mean, once that dang wreck it Ralph infected guy came through, I could understand. Wait, what even was that thing? Did they even explain that? Whatever, man. Sorry about that, Yuzu. Please continue. I'm going back into my corner with my coffee. Jeez. Is he gone? The narrative begins as Hayden is deployed to a Lazarian coastal town. The building he has been sent to infiltrate contains a Lazarian CIA operative, as well as the target of the operation. Hayden is very aware of an airborne virus that has been devastating the small country, and has to be reassured that his vaccines are capable of holding it off. Upon reaching the captured Lazarian operative, Hayden is told that their target is aware that the CIA have come to take him out. Hayden thoughtlessly kills the operative. He's infected, or compromised, or both, so leaving him alive could jeopardize the mission. Hayden's hunt for the target leads him to discover the Nemesis creature, a being far outside of Hayden's understanding of the situation, so Hayden attempts to blow it up with a rocket-propelled grenade. It's deflected, and Hayden is forced to dive into the water, where he finds the target, Mesner, the architect behind the deadly viral outbreak. Mesner instructs the nemesis to infect Hayden with the virus, causing his arm to mutate and granting Hayden the glaive weapon. Hayden manages to escape and now must continue to hunt Mesner while thwarting each of his plans to get the virus away from Lazria and into the rest of the world. The narrative is certainly pressing, but it appears rather infrequently throughout the game, and I found myself forgetting why I was trying to achieve certain objectives. The moment-to-moment -moment activity is primarily what the player will be exposed to, and it has been appropriately refined to be quite enjoyable. Hayden's movement speed seems slow at the outset, but the environments have been built to accommodate his comfortable pace. There are rarely wide open spaces to run through with nothing to see or do in them, which is certainly a good thing. Dark Sector does not contain an overly generous auto-aiming system, but with the broad coverage of the glaive's shape and trajectory, as well as the wide shooting reticle for the other guns, hitting enemies with projectiles is very easy. Hayden does have access to grenades sometimes, but they don't engage any kind of aiming reticle when armed, so there isn't much accuracy involved in their use. I like the rolling, but Hayden can often get stuck to cover and refuse to leave the hiding spot. This is such a ubiquitous issue among these cover-based shooters that I wasn't planning to comment on it, but because of Hayden's pitiful melee capability, I think it's worth commenting on. Hayden's infection, whether it's a zombie virus or nanomachines or an alien transformation, has caused his right arm to mutate, and allows him to summon a boomerang with knives on it that the game refers to as a glaive. It isn't at all what I would associate the term glaive with, so just keep that in mind. The thing looks pretty dangerous, and the way Hayden swings it around makes it seem lethal enough, but unless it's a pre-animated takedown, Hayden is incapable of dealing any significant damage with it. It's more like a punch with the hand that contains this bladed weapon, but no actual contact from any of the blades. 
When thrown, this weapon is capable of some gruesome damage to the things in its way. At the beginning, the glaive kills most enemies with a headshot and staggers them with any other hit. A staggered enemy leaves cover, stops attacking and becomes vulnerable to a takedown. Either way, an enemy hit by the glaive should end up dead soon after, provided the player isn't under too much other fire. As the player progresses through the game, more enemies are introduced with larger health values that are staggered by the headshots instead of killed. Timing the glaive throw to release during a small window causes a yellow trail to follow the weapon as well as deal additional damage. This more forceful throw also has utility in that it is capable of opening certain chained gates and boxes, although it isn't very necessary. The glaive is used as a key very, very often throughout Dark Sector. There are doors that are unlocked by throwing an electrified glaive into their mechanisms. There are doors that are burned through by throwing a burning glaive at them. The same doors can even be opened by throwing a freezing glaive into them and allowing them to shatter. Many of these doors are preceded by an execution test for the player to utilize the glaive's controllable function. The player must use the motion controls to weave the glaive through a pathway in order to acquire an elemental charge. Like reaching into the wall in Silent Hill 2 to get a key, except you play as the hand. The glaive can also be used to collect items that are out of reach, but there aren't any items that are out of reach throughout the entire game. There aren't optional tunnels to throw the glaive into for extra ammo or weapon upgrades, nor are there stashes of money that can't be walked over to and collected. Inclusions of these things seem natural, so perhaps the developer was coping with a tight deadline. I raise this suspicion because Dark Sector has a wealth of polish problems, with the vast majority of the problems affecting the game's enemies. There isn't a massive variety of enemies in the game, but what is here is a decent enough range of enemy types to allow digital extremes to keep deploying fresh encounters throughout the game's 8 hour runtime. While some arrangements of enemies are repeated, they are interesting enough to fight for this to be okay, especially within different environmental settings. The first zombies I encountered were expertly positioned, and their movements and attacks were unsettling and unnatural. The section in the dark drainage room was especially fantastic. As the zombies were emerging from the pipes and from under the water, I was enamored by the brilliance of the payoff. These standard zombies evolve unfortunately as the game goes on, and they become these goofy looking inflatable pool toy enemies, which is a shame. The Lazrian army is visually interesting as far as a standard enemy human could be. They are aware that there's an airborne component to the virus, so they often wear gas masks and even full hazmat suits when shooting at the player. Their technological capabilities are quite strange though. The Lazarians will occasionally deploy power armored soldiers and the jackal tanks, quadrupedic vehicles with a cannon and a machine gun but their rank and file gunners are tossed onto the battlefield with an AK-47 at most. The soldiers aren't the only enemies with ranged attacks, and it's the strange, alien creatures that manage to avoid some necessary polish. They'll often glide around as their animations stop functioning, which is another unfortunate blemish on the game's excellently tense atmosphere. They're also subject to the occasional scripting breakdown, although they aren't alone in this. Sometimes the enemies just can't deal with the situation they're in, so they don't. They just stand still and wait for something to change. This contrasts rather unusually with the number of enemies that actively flank the player to get a better angle. Maybe that flanking system is too fragile. I was also confused by a frequent occurrence throughout my playtime that doesn't immediately make sense. Sometimes, if an enemy is left alive for long enough, it'll die for seemingly no reason. The fighting will slow down, and then they'll just keel over. What's happening is these enemies are being killed by a poisoned bullet upgrade. It's so bizarre, and the mechanic seems really out of place within Dark Sector, but that's how a lot of the strange, causeless deaths were occurring. This one though, I cannot explain. Ah! 
He just doesn't exist anymore. So while the player and the zombies seem capable of destroying the regular enemies in a single hit, the bosses are a total reversal of that role. There are only four bosses to battle within Dark Sector, although I am excluding some encounters that could certainly be considered bosses. The power armored soldiers, the jackal tanks, and the helicopter encounters are more like mini bosses or puzzles. The Colossus, Nemesis, the Stalker, and Mesna have considerably more spectacle and weight tied to them that would earn them the boss fight title. Each of the major fights is introduced prior to their first encounter. The Colossus appears a few times before the player gets the opportunity to confront it inside of the cathedral. Hayden uncages the Stalker, which terrorizes the last remnants of control the military had within the city. And Nemesis is Mesner's right hand, a pair Hayden manages to meet a couple of times. The Colossus encounter has some glaring issues. This is a creature that has appeared previously in an encounter that the player could perceive as insurmountable. After exiting a warehouse, a handful of soldiers appear to intercept Hayden's path and a fight breaks out. During this encounter, the Colossus appears and starts charging around the environment. It will effortlessly kill the player if they don't get out of its way, and it doesn't seem that any weapons deal any damage to the creature. The Colossus will eventually just run away, only to be later seen destroying a jackal before retreating into the cathedral. A method to damage the Colossus hasn't been demonstrated to the player prior to the battle. Inside the cathedral, the boss hangs from the rafters and throws chunks of the building at the player. The player must simply ignite the glaive and hit the boss. It'll fall down and become vulnerable to a takedown. This repeats a couple of times before the boss refuses to climb into the rafters again. While on the ground, the Colossus charges around, throws chunks of the floor at the player, and occasionally starts emitting a flammable gas. At this stage, the player just has to keep shooting the boss until it dies. I beat this boss on my first encounter, and it took me 12 minutes to finish this fight, 10 of which were in that second stage, shooting at the boss. There's nothing that indicates the boss is being damaged by this, and setting it on fire over and over isn't treated like a revelation. I was about 9 minutes into this damage phase when I paused and googled if I was doing the right thing. There are sandbags at the center point of the cathedral that the Colossus cannot cross so the player can just stand behind them and deal damage to the boss indefinitely. Why does this enemy have this much health? The Stalker, on the less mutated hand, is incredible. There is a late game enemy that is capable of turning invisible, although it doesn't really do much while it can't be seen. The Stalker is far more dangerous, and its invisibility is the boss's primary method of attack. Hayden and the Stalker fall into a cooling room deep under the city, the floor of which is partially flooded. While invisible, the Stalker will charge toward the player and swipe at them, dealing a lot of damage if it hits. The player must use the splashes in the water and the tremendous sound design to track the creature so they know when to dodge and where to attack. In order for this fight to work, Digital Extremes had to put a lot of faith in the sound design and the results are excellent. If too much chaos had occurred, and the water was jostled and disturbed, I couldn't determine exactly where the stalker was, but as it stomped toward me, I was well warned of its approach. Such a well-made encounter. Unfortunately, the Stalker is the only great encounter, but Nemesis and Mesner never fall as low as the Colossus. Nemesis is the armored person that caused Hayden's infection by stabbing him with their blade. They were also capable of redirecting a rocket-propelled grenade in flight back toward Hayden right at the start of the game. The boss fight is simply dodging their attacks, electrifying the glaive, hitting the Nemesis with it, and then repeating that until the boss dies. The visual design of this encounter is really good. I like Nemesis' design, but the mechanics are so excessively bland. 
a duel with an equally acrobatic opponent could have been very interesting within Dark Sector's mechanical systems, but Nemesis does not deliver. Finally, Mesner is the reason all of this has occurred, and his encounter is the final battle. Mesner himself doesn't appear to be mutated at all by the virus, and because of that, he sits atop a massive nondescript viral flesh, which contains the hive mind, I think. What's happening here is that there's a man behind a shield and a bunch of tentacles which, when active, keep the shield active. The player must hit the weak points on the tentacles' limbs, then hit the mouth part in the middle of the tentacles' hands to destroy them. When all of the tentacles are destroyed, the shield opens and the player can damage Mesna. Do this three times and the fight is over. I think it's a visually interesting fight, but it's awfully tedious. The game has been very generous with hitboxes up to this point, but the weak points on the constantly moving tentacles were just an effort to hit. I was never in danger of being killed by the boss, but I did spend a long time here trying to hit the tentacles. It's a bit of a sour note to end the game on, but at least it looks cool. Dark Sector opens in grayscale despite being set in 2007. Color eventually activates upon Hayden becoming infected although the differences are quite small. This city on the Lazarian coast is heavily industrialized, and the vast majority of the game's environments are brick buildings, so things get stale in the later areas. Hayden does spend a fair amount of his adventure inside, which does add some much needed variation, but still rarely gives the impression of somewhere different. With all of that said though, a lot of Dark Sector's locations are masterfully directed, when the game wants to look spooky, it absolutely delivers. The character models are mainly great, particularly the zombie models, which the player gets a really good look at whenever they brutally break their arms. Hayden's face is a little odd. It's either uncanny or maybe a bit out of proportion with the rest of his body. Nadia and Yargo are impressive models for the time, and the precursor Warframes hanging around are oozing with style. I was routinely impressed by the audio design too. Audio engineering within video games is one of those aspects of the product that a casual player wouldn't notice if it was well done. Everything sounds like it's supposed to, so as long as nothing glaringly poor shows up, the experience can coast along without any audio hitches. Dark Sector's sound design has gone beyond good enough and enters noticeably impressive territory. The ambiance throughout a lot of the game's locations is mesmerizing. When things slow down and the player is left to explore a large, empty building, the music and the diegetic sounds are still humming along. It's a bit of a rarity for me to be blown away by sound design, but I can't get over how tense some of these locations are, and the piercing screams of the zombie enemies always seem to engage some kind of chaotic battle against a horde of the things. I know I already gushed about the stalker's terrific sound design, but it would have been so easy to get this wrong. And as silly as the graveyard segment is, the intensity of the audio lifts it out of that conceptually awful puddle it could have wallowed in. I think the sound design does a lot of the heavy lifting throughout Dark Sector. Currently, Dark Sector's place in video game history won't be more than a lead-in to whatever legacy Warframe has. Alone, Dark Sector is a competent third-person shooter that does little to advance the genre and is content to occupy Resident Evil 4's shadow. Zombies, cover-based shooting, and an ambiguously evil organization weren't new ideas prior to 2008, and as the game has aged, those things are becoming less and less unique. Dark Sector is certainly entertaining, and the atmosphere alone is worth the $30 maximum this game is still worth. So long as you aren't expecting some secret masterpiece, you won't be disappointed by this. 
Overall, the amount of Resident Evil within Dark Sector is enough to make Digital Extremes game redundant on arrival. If the developer had leaned farther into their alien virus, or done something more exciting with the glaive, then this game could have been more successful in separating itself from its inspiration. It isn't a plagiarised remake of Capcom's game, but the artistic value of the whole package isn't especially high. Much like my conclusions on Morphex, there was something interesting to explore here, but not enough to encourage widespread acknowledgement of the product. So Dark Sector is valuable to collectors, and not many others. I'll be travelling to Saturn next week.